education and complexity and thought process does it take for you all to decide what level this patient or what treatment this patient must have. Strange. We're also in the middle of changing because in a new patient, it has always been medical decision making has been driving the level of care that you would provide. Now it's going to medical necessity. And with the international health care bill that's going into effect, it's even going to change further. So these are the various types of initial visits you have. Patient hasn't been seen by you or anybody in your practice in the past three years. It doesn't have to be you, it could have been three years ago. She could have seen him, we're in practice together, it's an established patient. If it had been three and a half years, it would have been a new patient. That's the rules at this time. You also have no known diagnosis or an illness, but you could, the patient comes in, he's a new patient, and he says, hey, I've got hypertension, I've been treated in the past for it. He knows he's got that problem. It's still new to you and to providing him the treatment. And of course, preventative visits. Huge in this healthcare bill that we're facing and, and the new world that we're going into is preventative maintenance. We wanna get the patients in there to prevent the disease from progressing. Established patient, known patient in, to you or to someone in your practice. You'll be working with an MD. It could be that that MD has been seeing this patient and now it's gonna be you seeing him. That's still an established patient. You've never seen him, but your partner has, or your preceptor. No diagnosis and illness, of course. You, he walks in and says, hey, he's been treating me for years. Next slide. We also have inpatient codes. You all may or may not be working in an inpatient arena. You are, are allowed to go in after the initial H&P is being completed. You can go in and see for a subsequent hospital visit. Did you all realize it? If your practice has admitting privileges, you can do that follow-up for your physician. And these are, you have sub subsequent initial, which would be by your MD or DO, and then you could do the subsequent visit and follow-up. And then of course the discharge has to be done by the provider. You can start it, but then he would have to finish it. Something interesting that's come up in the VA, and I have to brag on the VA for a minute. The VA, I'm very proud of the VA. The VA is very cutting edge. And we, in the past, Joint Commission has allowed us to have 30 days to complete a discharge summary. You had that time frame. Now, VA has now cutting edge because of the health care bill. They want that discharge summary done, completed, and viewable in our electronic health record prior to the patient walking out the door. Continuity of care. It's very important, and that is your patient can go from you going out of the hospital, he looks great, he walks down the three blocks and he drops. They need that discharge summary so they can see what went on with him and what you provided. Makes sense. Why he came in, what treatment you provided, how he responded, what you told him to go home with, your instructions. Final diagnosis, procedure's done. That should be a summary. It should be no more than two paragraphs long and contain everything you need. It will include any lab work that was abnormal during the hospitalization and needs followed up on. That is a big issue. Again, VA is very cutting edge and we have now got a mandate that we are to notify, and this is nationally going in with because of the healthcare law. You have to notify patients of all diagnostic test results within 14 days of you receiving the results. And you have to be able to prove you yeah, notified them. You have to document it somehow. So if you send them a letter, that's fine. You notate that in the record that you sent a letter of notification of lab results. All diagnostic tests, that's in x-rays, MRIs, GI procedures, diagnostic procedures such as your colonoscopies, endoscopies, your doctor ordered a test as an inpatient, stress test. You come in with chest pains, rolled out for an MI. He says, okay, we want you to have a stress test. That stress test is completed as an outpatient. It is your provider, the ordering provider's responsibility to notify that patient of the results of that stress test after he's left the hospital. 
We have hospitalists, and in every one of these hospitals, we have hospitalists. If they order a test, it then falls on the attending physician to notify that patient of those results. So you're going to be actively involved with that. And all of this is being generated from our new health care law. And it's going to get more detailed as it rolls out. Progress notes. Everything is generated. Your money is generated and supported by your progress notes. These are the elements of a progress note. Soap notes, you all know about. You've all been writing them probably for years. You learned them in training. Subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. Treatment rendered to the patient on a day of visit, outlines treatment, response, reflects any new problems that have arisen, any labs that are abnormal, time spent with the patient. You can code according to time. However, if you use time as a supporting factor for your E&M level, Evaluation and Management Code, which is your office visit code, you have to put in there that more than 50% of the time spent with the patient was involved with explaining to him his options, his disease, his disease process. You have to tell us why you spent so much time with him. Patient's hard of hearing, can't see too well, has, isn't cognitively impaired, but he has difficulty understanding you. Language barrier, cultural barriers. You have to tell us why you spent so much time with him. These are your different components of your elements of your documentation. History of prels and illness includes your chief complaint, history of the present illness. You must have at least adjectives. Use adjectives in your history of present illness. And you'll see that in a moment. Review of systems. Anyone can re take your review of system. You as the provider will then go in and say, I reviewed review of systems and all have, are correct. Patient complains of this. But your clerk, a clerk, a health tech, anybody can take a review system, but you have to verify the information is correct. Pertinent past history, family and or social. Social is not just he works, he's retired. It's social. What's his living conditions? Does he have a support system? Does he, is he able to travel to your office or out of your office? You need to know those type of dynamics. Does he have access to food? You know, you're going to find a lot of dynamics going on here. And you'll, you'll go back to that social history a lot. Also, when you're dealing with them, especially like I'll use a veteran, if you put down that patient was a veteran in the Navy, that counts as social history. But then you go ahead and say he's retired from AT&T, He's homeless at this moment because of whatever. Examination, it's dependent on clinical judgment, nature of presenting problem. You are to address the problem he presents for. You may find other problems once you start examining him, but your major reason for seeing that patient is why did he come to your office today? They will not accept because you told me to. They won't accept follow-up. They will accept follow-up of hypertension, diabetes, fall, cut on his finger, whatever. Anxiety. Anybody in mental health? Okay, mental health. Big issue with mental health, follow-up. So uh, we have a lot of nature presenting problems. And mental health coding's changing. It, they turned it upside down this year. I just went over that. Assessment and medical decision making, this is again, how much time, how much education, how much complexity, how much thought did you have to go into? Research, talking to your provider. If you go in and you see a patient, geriatric, and all of a sudden that patient just doesn't strike you right. He's not remembering things. He's not the way he was the last time you saw him. He, his effect is different. His mood's different. He's not dressed right. You want to talk to your provider, you put that in your note. Discussed patient with doctor. Mm -hmm. That increases your level of complexity. You have consulted another physician. And so your level goes up. And you'll see how that affects it. Each one of them have four different levels. Next. OK, this is your chief complaint. Again, this is why the patient's being seen. If it's an established patient, 
We have different, two different type of guidelines at this point. The government has come out with 95 guidelines, which was written for a general practitioner. We have 97 guidelines, which is more for the specialist. At this moment in time, you can choose what guidelines you use. You can even use both, but you have to delineate it and make sure that everybody understands. If an auditor comes in, you can say, this one's a 95. I, my outpatient established, I go with 95. If you're working in a specialty office, you will probably use the 97 guidelines. They're easier to meet on the specialist arena. But if you've got a 95 guidelines and 97 guidelines and it's established patient, all you have to do to meet the, all of the qualifications for that history of present illness instead of all of this, if you'll put down follow-up of diabetes, but you got to say the status of the diabetes. Is it controlled? Is it worsening? Is it improving? Is it stable? Hypertension. Patient reports that it's stable. And then you have congestive heart failure or obesity or tobacco abuse, whatever state the status with those three chronic conditions and you've met all of the documentation you'd have to do up there. You've hit it all and move on. Simple, it sounds silly, but it's down dirty and it's simple. But your money is based on how many patients do you see and what level do you charge them. Remember that. Next slide. Here's the seven elements of a, of a history of present illness if you're going to, for an established patient or a new patient. These are the items that you need to address. You have to have four out of the seven. Severity, patient complains of a sore throat, pain level is a five. Or he, severity, he has a sore throat, is unable to swallow, unable to take solid foods, can only tolerate liquids, has been sipping on ice, that's severity. Timing, how long has he had it? Well, when did he get it? Does it occur? Gastric upset. It occurs every time he eats something greasy, every time he has a hamburger, every time he eats a french fry. Duration, how long has he had it? Has it lasted over two weeks, three weeks, five years? Context and quality, that's where you're just describing what the patient's telling you, and we can count those. Associated signs and symptoms. He has a sore throat. He also has a fever. He's nauseated. He's got chills, vomiting. Those associated signs and symptoms. Modifying factors. What did he take for it? Did he take an? He had chest pains. Did he take an aspirin? Did he lay down and rest a while? Did he stop doing what he was doing? He's short of breath, so he stopped and it re was alleviated or not? Those are your modifying factors. What did he do to make it improve? But you got to have four out of the out of the seven. Adjectives, adjectives, adjectives. Go back to your English. Here's your review of systems again. Clerk, LPN, RN. Somebody else can do this for you. You just have to verify it. Also, you cannot state all negative or see history of present illness for review of system. We can only count it once. We can't count it in the review of system and the history of present illness. So if you go on and on and on about the history of present illness, it doesn't matter. I can only count what he's going in. So he's saying he's got, he denies uh, diarrhea, he's got the fever. He denies diarrhea, he denies a GI upset, he denies nausea and vomiting. And then you come down and review a system and tell him the same thing. I can't, I can only count it once. It's just one of their rules. Also, all others negative is no longer acceptable according to CMS coding guidelines. And we all follow CMS. Everybody knows what CMS is? Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, yeah. Past family history, again, this is just telling you some of the things that you can have. Next. These are your following body areas, head, neck, chest, abdomen, go on. Each extremity counts as one point. So make sure you say all four extremities because that gives you four points. Strange, I know. Organ systems. This is the 97 guidelines. It, now you can see where a specialist would hit it easier than a primary care provider. You can go into the gastrointestinal and go down and go on and on and on. He can get a higher level than what a general practitioner can. 
by using the certain guidelines. These are your problem, these are your levels of codes, your evaluation and management codes. Problem focus, straightforward, 99211. We usually only use 99211, that's established patient, basic, straight problem. He comes in with a sore throat, we give him an aspirin, send him home. He comes in, he has the hiccups, and we tell him to hold his breath and straighten it up, take a deep breath, and he's okay. That's problem focused. We usually only use the 99211 for nursing. Anybody that has the higher education automatically goes to the level two, which is nice. Expand the problem focus a little bit more. You gotta talk to him a little bit more. Yeah, you're gonna give him a prescription drug. Detailed, you're going to go into an exam, extensive, or an extended exam of one area. He comes in with belly pain, you're going to palpate the stomach, you're going to see about the liver, you're going to check out all kinds of areas. Comprehensive. Very seldom will you all get to the comprehensive end of it, because you're going to go get your doctor and say, hey, this guy's more than I can handle. But it's going to be a complete examination of a single organ, and that's 12 points in that single organ system. So again, this is going back to that specialist. This is your medical decision making. This is what drives the level of ENM, Evaluation and Management Code, you will assign. It refers to how much time, training, effort did you all have to use, how much did you look into that record, how much did you review that record, how much time did you spend. And it's really not as bad as it looks, but this is what your medical decision making is. It's now being tied to medical necessity. You all have been around, you all have seen, doctor comes in and he orders an MRI and the patient hasn't even had an x-ray yet. CMS is now saying, you don't need the MRI, let's try the more basic element. That's what's driving the medical necessity. You must be able to support that test. The other day I was at an eye exam, I was having my eyes exam, and I could hear the clerk out front, and she wanted an MRI on a child who was having problems, and she was trying to pick a code, and CMS will tell you, yes, this, we have software, and it'll tell you, yes, this will support that test or not. And she was putting in all kinds of codes, and if she had just gone to her symptom codes, the pa little girl had bulging eye all of a sudden. It was painful to, and when she moved it. She had pain in it. It was excess of watering. She had headaches. It would have supported the MRI. But she was trying to give him a specific diagnosis without going to the doctor. She didn't want to bother him. You all have been there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On the outpatient side of the house, go to your symptoms codes for your diagnosis why the patient, what needs the test. She didn't have a definitive diagnosis, so she wanted to give it a non-specific code. Doesn't work. You gotta go to your symptoms. She would have justified it in three. I'm sitting in the exam room giggling. <laughs> I did tell the doctor to go and help her, but I, I, I just felt sorry for her. And usually I don't. If I go to a doctor, they don't have any clue what I do for a profession. I just keep my mouth shut and just sit there, but she really struggled. Now, what's in it for you? This is your income. This is keeping the doctor off your back. This is keeping your group practice happy, and this is keeping your office manager elated. Exactly. I mean, she's going to become your best friend. I'm going to give you some examples. We have, these are the, our various coding classifications. We have ICD-9-CM, International Classification of Disease, Ninth edition, clinical modification. We're the only people in the world that has CM. That's because we tied money to it. We have CPT-4. This is written by the AMA. It's owned by the AMA. And that is your evaluation and management codes. It's also every procedure code. Again, money's tied to it. Hicks picks. This is your actual healthcare procedural codes. But that is more for your drugs, your DME, which is your durable medical equipment, dental, any of the temporary codes that CMS has come out with, 
They want to see if they should create a code. That goes in there. Then there's supplies and alcohol abuse, temporary orthotics. So those are your, your different types of code books. And they're about, at this time, they're about this big. Just wait. By the time you all graduate, we'll be into ICD-10. We're going to be in ICD-10. And ICD-10, in, in ICD-9, I believe I got a slide in here about the change. I think yeah. You did. Coding's based on documentation. If you don't document it, it wasn't done, and we're not going to make it up for you. CMS has a whole slew of, it has a whole department of people called RACs, recovery audit contractors, that come in and say, oh no, that doesn't support that code. We want this much money back. One hospital just paid out the largest RAC recovery audit ever and it was like 15 million dollars and they got to pay it all back at one time they don't do it little they want it now Is this local or regional? no re, uh, national and it, it they went in they found it and they paid back 15 million dollars that's a practice it's not a hospital that's a practice it, that's why a lot of your you're seeing a lot of your practices a lot of your doctors are going in working for hospital groups the hospital group or the groups going to go and they let the hospital own them and they're like an employee and that's why because of these rack recovery they have recouped so much money they've now created a monster it's like a like you know you all probably don't remember pac-man yeah. oh, yeah. pac-man comes along and he, they're just eating up people preventative medicine codes are based on age by the way these are your codes and I've delineated them out here. Now, this observation. Observations use 23 to 48 hours. CMS just released a new rule, and it's called the 72-hour rule. And it used to just pertain to surgeries. Anything that occurred 72 hours prior to the admission for the surgery didn't get paid for it, it got rolled into the payment for the surgery. CMS has now expanded that. So if he goes in and sees his primary care provider on Monday and he gets admitted on Wednesday or within three days, they don't pay the doctor for the office visit. If he has a test, they don't pay for the test. They consider it part of the hospitalization. You got to learn CMS. It's, it, it's a monster. And everything governs. It governs everything. Once CMS puts out something, all third-party insurances will follow line. They just fall right in line. So this this observation is it's getting iffy because a lot of practices will admit a patient for 23 hours to rule out kind of diagnoses, and then they say, "Oh well, he really needs to stay." Well, you don't get paid for that first day because it's getting rolled into that hospitalization. So it's, it's causing quite a stir, quite a stir. These are your preventative medicine. They go all the way down to infant, zero age, all the way up to 100 plus. Your mental health, this is obsolete. I gotta send you a new thing. Mental health, they have turned mental health on its head this year. They did away with these codes. They did away with group code. They did away with, we used to have what was called medication management code. They did away with it. Now the mental health providers are required to use the same E&Ms as your general practitioners. Anybody in this group figure out how much that's going to cost our psychiatrist? Because they don't examine. So how are you going to get to a higher level E&M if you don't examine the patient? They talk to them. They don't examine them. <laughs> and now instead of one code because this was one code and this was like 20 minutes and the next one was you know 30 minutes and the next one was 40 minutes now you gotta have two you gotta have psychotherapy code and then you gotta have your E&M code so instead of one code you gotta have two they've turned that world upside down I'm getting ready to do a presentation to our mental health providers Dr. Buchanan in another month and this has really caused quite a stir.
really big time. The doctors will, well, what they can do is nowhere does it say in the code books, this is a coder telling you this, nowhere does it say in CMS that you have to lay hands on a patient. So it's all in the wording. Patient's mood, you know, you can do the psych thing, it's mood, appropriate dress, alert and oriented, all that. And then he can also say patient's complexion is pink, patient appears to be skin's warm and dry from what I can see. Nowhere does it say I have to touch that patient. So by observing the patient, you see him walk in, his gait is normal or he's limping or he has difficulty, he's walking with a walker. You can count that as your examination. You saw him, you observed him. It's all in the wording. So they can get it, but I can't imagine the psychiatrist. Does anybody work for a psychiatrist? You do. Psychiatrist beat to this drum over here instead of this drum. So it's, it's going to be interesting. They're, they're, they're a strange group. Here is your money. This is just basic money. It's funny money, but it's based on CMSs. You can see low level e and for a new patient is $58 but you come down to a comprehensive detailed exam and he gets almost $400. Same time frame, but it's based on documentation. <laughs> now, a lot of people fall into the fallacy, if I choose a level three, I'm cool. I'll go under the radar, I'll never get audited, everything will be hunky-dory, wrong. Because they run these algorithms all through. CMS is constantly running reports. So is all your third party insurances. And they can tell you at any time what, how your bell curve is going according to your patients. And it's supposed to be a bell curve. You have to have so many here, so many at two, so many at three. Three should be your norm, but here's four and over here's five. So if they see this constantly and you've got a perfect bell curve, they know you're cheating. If they see a flat line, everybody's at a three, they're gonna come out at you. And believe it or not, when CMS comes in to audit you, they may tell you that you're undercoding, but they're not gonna give you money for it. <laughs> they're gonna let you dig for it. But most of the auditors won't tell you that. They only tell you about where you're overcoding and they want their money back. Very few auditors, especially from the government and the RACs will not tell you you know, you could have got this level four here, but your documentation is based on level three. I want my money. And they just take it. If it's a Medicare patient, they just take it on the next transmittal. And a lot of times you end up owing them money instead of getting them money. And most of your practices run on getting that CMS check and transmittal. This is your established patient. You can see the differences between the two. There's a le little less money for the lowest level, a little less money for the highest. This, very few patients will get because these are the patients that you're either going to send to surgery within the next 24 hours, uh, put him in ICU, he's having chest pains, something along those lines. He's an acute GI bleed. It's not that hard to get these two levels but your documentation has to support it. The patient comes in and he has a... I think that's the last thing. I don't know. If he comes in and he does a... Uh, he has cut his finger. And you just put in there, patient cut his finger, has laceration on his index finger, and he... I sutured it, two sutures, put a Band-Aid on it, send him home. You're going to get... And I'll send you that presentation to get... Oh, that could be, yeah. So uh, you'll get probably $300 for it. If you will document the length of the laceration, what caused the laceration, what type of suture, how many sutures, and what type of dressing, you get almost $1,000 because the complexity has gone up. It's just in your wording. Wow. Yeah. Now, and I, I gotta send her a new one. ICD-10 is coming. ICD-10 has been around in the world since 2000. The United States is one of three 
countries and the other two are third world countries that don't use it. That's the embarrassing part. The October 1st, 2014, ICD-10 is coming. We're going from something like 16,000 codes, diagnosis codes, to 78,000. To give you an example, diabetes has 45, 47 codes in ICD-9. We're going to have over 250 codes in ICD-10. Just for that. Can you provide us with like an example of, was it what you're talking about, diabetes type 2, stable? No longer exists. <laughs> diabetes type 2 no longer exists in ICD-10. None of your Latin terminology exists in ICD-10. None of your procedures that are named after the person that created them exist. You now are going to see a whole new terminology coming into play. You're going to, you know, the ectomy, otomy, ostomies, all of those, we, that's gone. That's gone. Come ICD-10, October 1st, 2014, you will not see that. You will not see that. You will see what a coder is required to do at that point is I am to read that procedure note and I am to determine what the surgeon decided or implied that he wanted to do. Was he going to take out the whole organ, part of the organ, slice into the organ? So appendectomy. Gone. Remove, I mean, what are you going to say? Remove appendix. Remove appendix. Well, actually, it'll be uh, excision of. Okay. Excision of. Okay. And they don't even use the word excision, really. They use, God, what is the word I'm trying to think of? It's some word that's really just all, so obtuse. Everybody's going, what? I mean, they're coming out with new, but I, I'll send you the new terminology because it is bizarre. In our procedures, we're going to go from 3,800 procedure codes. You ready for this? Over 92,000 codes. It's a build a code system if you're going to do procedures. You will have it in each one of them. Oh, it's the money, and it, that's why it's been taking so long. They have connected it to money again, and that's why it's taken so long. So V codes and everything. Are Gone. Oh. For you to get a code, a diagnosis code for history, you will have to look up history. It won't even be history of. Like if you have a patient with ostomy. In remission. Ostomy. You will put in their patients uh, uh, in remission for whatever caused the ostomy, and then you will say treatment of ostomy and go on down the line. If you have a cut finger, you have to say that he has a cut on his index finger on his right hand caused by, you know, whatever type of knife, saw, whatever. Then you have to tell how deep it is. Did it happen at home or did it happen at work? Did it happen in the public building? You have to tell us all of this extra information. So the money's in the details. Yep, money's in the details, big time. Yeah. Is it too late to switch majors? Now the good, the good part is you're gonna have a coder in your office or you're gonna have at least a consultant. And diagnosis codes you'll be able to you know, you're going to see the same type of diagnosis, just like you do diabetes type 2. You know, you're going to see that. It's when you get into a procedure, colostomy training. Yep. That's, that type of procedure is going to really be affected. The inpatient side of the house, hugely affected. Anybody working for a surgeon, hugely affected. And I've already started training, our coders at the VA has already started training on the new terminology. Anatomy and physiology, you're going to have to you know, know the that. The sad part about that is surgeons are the worst documentarians. Mm -hmm. They, yeah, they're horrible. I mean, they're fast, they're in and out of very little. They're well, they're going to, if they want money, they're going to have to start and give us the information. It, it's a major change in terminology. ICD-10 diagnosis codes it's cool. We can do this. You know, it's a change. It's a different way of looking at it. However, on the procedure side of the house, CPT, I told you, CPT is owned by AMA, and that's all your procedures. They are fighting this tooth and nail, and have since 2000. CMS was supposed to initiate it October 1st, 2013. 
The doctors held their breath and turned blue, so they said, okay, we'll give you one more year. Maybe they won't strike. Well, the big thing is, is it's an embarrassment when the United States stands up and tries to say how great our health care system is, and we're the only world country in the world that's not using it, that's not third world country that's developed. So that's rather embarrassing. So we're going to go to 10 and I will send you a presentation because it's, it's huge and everybody needs to start changing now. And I'm even working with our doctors to change their way of documenting at the VA now so that when it comes and it happens, it, they won't even notice. It'll just be normal routine and they've gone through it slowly and, and been able to adjust to the terminology. I find it interesting that the money's in the details because I, I'm working in two hospitals who've just gone to computer charting and mm -hmm. as a nurse, mm -hmm. I don't feel like it gives enough information, that you're not charting enough stuff and what I've kind of heard in two separate hospitals, but from both places, it's kind of like they don't want you to chart. They do want you to chart, but they want you to use templates. Right. So everything's the same. When you get on the provider side, usually they'll let you, A, you develop your own template, and they will make sure that you hit that level four on your documentation, because you'll be clicking. I, I, we can tell them, can't we? Templates are the huge thing. Our templates are set up so that you click and you can go down through there and click and when you click it opens up and says positive or negative and they'll say positive. It's just a point and click, make it as fast as possible. Examinations are there, they just have to point and click as a positive, negative, edema, whatever, you know, examination wise. Templates will put you to a certain level. Be careful of templates, because if you're seeing somebody with a sore throat and you're hitting a level four, CMS is going to come along and say, medical necessity, you didn't need it. He didn't need that, you know, MRI of his throat because he had a sore throat. So templates are a, a positive and a negative. The electronic health record is here to say it's getting bigger. Doctors are being paid bonuses to develop their own electronic health record. They are being paid big bucks to incorporate it. The reason being is we've got a presidential initiative that wants everybody to have one health record from birth to death. And it's called the Lifetime Virtual Electronic Record, LVR. And that is our initiative and we are moving towards that as, at a very fast pace. That we will share records between, the VA now does it. It's, it's one of two, two huge conglomerates that can do it. Kaiser Permente is the other. They can share records from West Coast to East Coast. The VA can share records from West Coast to East Coast and Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands, wherever there's a VA. We can go in and remotely see what you had done yesterday in, in California and the records. But they want that to be able to share across to the private sector as well. So. And we are sharing our records with the DRD. Uh, currently, if I update my allergies in the, my system, it'll update the allergies in the DOD system. So they've already bridged that gap for us. So we're already there. Uh, we have what's called My Healthy Vet, another step towards it. My Healthy Vet is if you're registered, you have secured messaging, you can send an email and a healthcare provider will answer that email and if it's pertinent clinically, they pass it on to the doctor and he answers it. If it's not and it's about his vacation and he had the hiccups while he's on vacation, the nurse sends back and says, I'll make sure the doctor knows. Don't bother. You know, that's not pertinent. I don't care you went tuna fishing on your vacation. But we of January 1st are allowing our veterans who are enrolled in My Healthy Vet to see their records and the documentation in their records. So don't be sending someone That's yes. exactly right. <laughs> Do not put anything derogatory in the patient's record. It'll come back and bite you. Because they're reading it and they're going to come after you with a vengeance. Sounds like that might prohibit honesty. honesty. <laughs> no. On, you can t say somebody is inappropriately dressed or, you know, is not clean without saying he looks like a bum. Yeah. He stinks. 
you can say there's an odor. It used to be in the VA, we had a rule, we had a regulation that said any mental health issue, any, health, any mental health note had to be approved by the provider that wrote the note before we could release it to the patient to make sure that it didn't detrimentally hurt the patient or cause harm. No longer. He gets it. Now, our psychotherapy notes are not in our medical records. The true personal psychotherapy notes are hidden in another system that patients don't know. And they're not accessible and they're not releasable. But our true mental health notes, and you'd be surprised, we got residents, folks. And they'll get angry at each other and point fingers. He didn't do this and she didn't do that and she yelled at me. And this is all in the patient record. Yeah, I, got a, I actually have a note that I had to redact so it wasn't viewable. Two residents made a date for later that night in a medical record. No. They forget. They're not in email. That's the problem with the electronic record. They forget they're texting and they forget what they're documenting in. So, yeah. So you got to be aware, don't make derogatory comments, don't make slanderous comments about your patients. You can say he's dirty, that he smells bad, he's got urine on him. You can say that without being derogatory. Patient comes in, he's got an odd smell to his breath, slurred speech, he staggers. You probably didn't hear patient's drunk. No, patient's diabetic and his blood sugar's out of sight. You just t did libel. He can sue you. He wasn't drunk. In the pediatric world, a lot of our medical problems mm -hmm. and non-medical problems are social problems, related mm -hmm. to social problems. And a lot of our documentation has to do with what we observe, mm -hmm. parent-child interactions, and, and then the next course of action. And if families could see those things, I think it would be... Um, You're they can see them. I got news for you. They can see them. All they got to do is come in and sign a release and say I want them. They just have to pay where the VA is opening it up and it's free. Is the VA initiative where everybody's going to be? I don't know. Hospitals will still charge. <laughs> no, actually, this, uh, this, this new health care initiative, it's the patient's record. I, think I maintain it, but it's your information. I You don't have to say. You just be very tactful. Yeah, you say it tactfully. I mean, you guys laugh, but I mean, malodorous is an acceptable term. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to literally communicate in a harsh way that someone is abusing. No, you do not. You suspect they're abusing. You don't know that they're abusing. Remember, there's that fine line. You may suspect. What you do is on that case. But I'm, I'm talking mental abuse. I'm talking about you can document. Parent seems to be very stern with the child. The child seems to be guarded when interacting with his parent. You said the same thing. I said the same thing, but I didn't say parent is abusing, mentally abusing the child. Right. Which is more acceptable to you? Her parent used harsh words. You know what I'm saying? That's yes. But you're going to have to. Yeah. But that is how you do it. It's all in the terminology. Parent used harsh words to the child to include explicitives. You don't have to say what he said. Trust me, I've said plenty of explicitives in my notes. One thing we've really talked also with them is the uh, SOB. Yeah. Uh -huh. The parents believe that. Why in the world Shortness of breath. Yeah. The other thing what you can do is if you put it, if you feel strongly, you can put it in quotes. Parent use the following terms and quote it. Then you're legally free and clear. Uh-huh. You quote it. And you're good in your court of law that it's not And 
Uh, yeah, you're good in your court of law, and I would use term of mother or father or male present, female present, because you never know if they're the parent or not. And you need to differentiate between, don't say parent, because you don't know which parent then did it. You have to say the male or the female present. Adult female or adult male with child use these terms and always quote it. And then you're legally cleared because that's what you heard. Be exact in what you hear. I always tell them to document what you see, hear, smell, and measure. Nothing else. Don't say patient fell on the floor unless you saw him fall on the floor. Right. And it's a real fine line between adequate documentation and rambling. Too much information or not enough. And it's that fine line and you will learn that. And all of a sudden you're all the ones that's sitting there and you'll pick up things when you're the provider, you're the NP, you're talking to that patient, you're going to pick up things that you didn't have time to do when you was an army. Good luck. Welcome to the profession. And, and it's not as bad as you think, really. Thank you. Have a good evening.